They used to be single hull boats. They used to be predominantly won by the US until uh, either the New Zealand, I think it was Australians with Dennis O'Connor, uh, maybe before you were born, um, just in the late 1990s, won it in Newport, Rhode Island, where it was always uh, held at the, the, in the territory of the winners, and they took it to Perth. Um, I don't know. I think on the first day of classes, when we looked, second day of class, when we looked at the, the montage of all these different uh, things, these three things of uh, fluid mechanics in natural processes, in engineering, and in sport, we looked at the keel with a, a bulbous, uh, um, a bulbous uh, oval, like a, the spare can on a, a fighter jet uh, for carrying fuel, the drop tanks. Uh, on the base of a keel. Apparently every time they put the boat in the water they would cover it in a shroud and then no one would know exactly what it was and it was something that's designed to make the boat go faster. You'd think that having something like that would perhaps slow it down but, uh, but it didn't. And so now the evolution of that I guess is to go to these uh, hydrofoils which are quite amazing. Not only hydrofoils but I guess they're trimorans. Uh, they lift themselves, or catamarans I guess uh, they are here. But not only they're catamarans which are supposed to be quite fast anyway and stable because of the, the width of them, uh, but they also lift themselves out of the water on a small wing, just a, basically a wing below the water, and cuts down on all the drag. So I think these guys go 70, uh, 60 miles an hour, something like that. So it's quite, quite amazing. So that's that. So that's, obviously we're talking about fluids today, and now we've graduated from talking about static fluids to being moving fluids. This is kind of, we'll ana analyze this at some stage. What, what force in the, or velocity do you have to have in your fire hose for you to be able to ride the fire hose video? Don't do this at home. He's a professional, no doubt, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so those are the kinds of questions we might want to solve. They're actually quite straightforward to, to solve. You've, many of you will have seen um, Bernoulli before. We introduced it on the first day of class. We, as if you, I imagine you've seen it in your other classes. Uh, this is slow. Don't know whether it's the connection in here or whether it's just that particular video. Oh no. And this is kind of similar to the, the fire hose video, but I guess maybe a bit more respectable version of that in that you see this yellow tube coming up behind the person. That's the umbilical to a, a pump that sits in a little um, chassis that floats on the water behind him and pumps water into it and then it gets sprayed out of these nozzles behind his left and right shoulders to allow uh, him to direct where he wants to go. It's a so-called jet lev, which I think is kind of a, an interesting thing. Some, it's some crazy amount of money as well. It's not, not particularly inexpensive, but it's kind of an interesting thing to be able to fly on. So, again, we can analyze that in the same principles that we'll use for the, uh, the, the, the fire hose rodeo. And then this one, which we'll look at today to analyze, ultimately, when we get to it, is... Um, let me put the sound on just to see what happens. I guess it's not that interesting. The sound. the sound is music. I guess you'd hear the jet engines. So this um, is a, a staged video. It'll tell you somewhere in there. Um, staged in that it looks at the um, the dangers of walking or driving behind uh, jet engines uh, or airplanes when they're revved up and ready to go. And so it's a little demonstration. It's at uh, San Francisco International. If you've, any of you have ever traveled there, it's quite a recognizable airport. And it's making the case that uh, if you drive behind one of these, certainly if you walk behind it, but if you drive, even if you drive behind it with this towed pickup truck, then there might be some undesirable consequences for you. And so we'll, we'll talk about that today. So that's the undesirable consequence. Of course, you saw that no one was in it. I guess they recovered it from the, uh, from the bay. The San Francisco Bay is where it ended up, but quite, quite amazing. Perhaps not surprising, really, when you look, we saw the 747 before. is kind of a, a structure that's a little bit heavier than air, and to get it off the ground, you have to put a bit of energy into being able to, 
uh, get that down the runway. Maybe it, uh, takeoff speeds are gets uh, are about a couple hundred miles an hour. So you have to be able to to apply that to do it. So that's the eye candy for us today. Um, I did send out at the uh, last time. Get rid of that. Don't need WeChat. Um, we can look at. I said we'd look at the, um, the test. This is the email that was sent out miraculously while I was live here on uh, on Monday morning at eight o'clock. Uh, Canvas, of course, sends these things up. Of course, you realize that the email you get on Saturday morning, I'm not, well, sometimes I am up at midnight on Friday night, but usually I'm not sending out uh, class emails. Um, the stuff I think is pretty self-explanatory, um, but in terms of overview, um, the tests are on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, different uh, half hour midterm each day. Uh, they're similar to the one that is on line that you've had access to for three weeks except that one is one page typically these as you see from the last year are two pages um, last year was the first time we did this online so the previous year's uh, tests are similar in material i think they're more involved because you have longer time to do it the whole idea of s switching it into a 30 minute period and making it relatively logical from question to question is to, to make sure, uh, to discourage people from being able to, to collaborate, right? If you're under some kind of time pressure. So the time pressure is unfortunate, but that's a, a reality, I think, of our situation. Uh, because uh, you can do it either here, if you want to come here. I'll probably come here on Monday and see if anyone turns up also and do all my stuff from here. Um, I, probably it's easy for you to do it at home uh, or wherever you, you work. Please don't do it with colleagues. Um, yeah, it has to be your own work. Uh, I guess last year it was easier because you'd have been in your parents' basement, the large percentage of you, and so if you can't communicate. Here you're kind of en masse. Uh, if you want to come to class, do it here. If you want to do it at home, do it there. Uh, I'll sign on on Canvas on the, the Zoom room link that you have there at 7.45 probably um, and be available. Uh, Canvas will ultimately open automatically at 7.55 and it will close automatically at 8.31. And so typically, um, we'll keep Canvas open for you to ask chat questions. At some stage, maybe we'll graduate to using Canvas for chat, just so we don't have to have Zoom open. Maybe having Zoom <coughs> open gives you a, a, a sense of community, and perhaps is better psychologically. Um, ask questions by chat, not, by, not verbally. Uh, ask questions only of me or Jai Yi, who'll be online. Um, and we'll answer them on chat for everybody. And so I, I guess I would broadcast chat on here. I guess you'd get it on your computers if you're in here. I imagine if you come to class, the bandwidth is good enough to be able to handle that in this room. Um, the review uh, session is online, so you have that. If you have not looked at this already. And so it's a standard review session that you've seen for other things. Um, as uh, before, I encourage you to look at the previous reviews just to make sure that I'm not scamming you when I say that probably all the equations you need and concepts you need are included in this, but of course you need to be able to, to mobilize them a pretty short time frame. So it's open book, open notes. Uh, we used to have a one page double sided equation sheet, uh, but clearly it's not possible to stop people from using the resources on their machine, and so that's the reason for that. And um, I guess the advantages of this is, is instant, instant gratification. You know your score straight away. I guess you get two attempts. The two attempts aren't for that, to allow you to see the answers or anything uh, gracious like that, generous like that. It's to be able to stop people accidentally submitting and then being locked out. And so uh, that's the reason for the two. I think when you press um, the button first, it tells you what your score is, but it didn't, doesn't tell you which ones are wrong or right. I, I, I can't remember. Uh, it'd be the same as the practice test that you can the, the, the format. Um, I'll give you a five minute warning, I guess a six minute warning at uh, 8.25, a one minute warning at um, 8.30. If for some reason your internet goes down or you have some other crisis, take a picture of your working or your answers or send them in an email quickly. Uh, take a picture with a phone and timestamp it to do whatever is reasonable. Our, uh, my uh, 
interest is not in penalizing anybody for anything like that, just to make sure that it's a, a bona fide real reason that, that it happened, right? And it happens typically to a few people each time. And so we can accommodate that. So that's kind of it. So I think it should be um, straightforward. Any any questions since I brought this? Great, yeah, I know it's not a fun thing. So it's, it's uh, a, a natural consequence of, of this class that you have to, it, it forces us, I know that when I'm forced to, uh, to deliver on things, it forces me to do things like learn the material, and that's really the, the, the purpose of this, I would, I would say. And so look on it as a possibility to be able to show your best work and show exactly what you know about this topic. So I think that's the, the, the framework that you should think about, about this in. Okay, no questions? Okay, yeah, great. Well, I'm happy that my notes and the backup have been straight, relatively straightforward and not too convoluted. All right. Okay. Back to reality. Uh, all right. So um, you recall that last time we finished the first segment of the, the class, which is talking about fluid statics seems strange that we're talking about accelerating fluids when we're talking about fluid statics, but indeed uh, we were. Um, uh, just to briefly recap, uh, and I think probably because uh, you know that if you looked at your materials that one of the questions is a linear acceleration question. Uh, we talked about that last time. We talked about how uh, with a free surface you'll get an accel acceleration will give you a change in gradient of that free surface. That change in gradient is given by this. The result of that change in gradient would be that the pressure distributions, if it's not accelerating vertically, is also given by um, this equation here, which just says that as you go down, the gradient of this pressure versus depth is equal to, I guess, P0 plus gamma h, you know that. It would be the same on both sides. All that changes is the boundary condition it responds to. If you accelerate upwards, then you know that um, the magnitude of the slope of the free surface is given by this term here, which includes both accelerations in x and in z. So this is ax and az. And if this is the case, then the pressure distribution changes. For a positive acceleration, it's a greater suprahydrostatic. This would be the hydrostatic. This would be suprahydrostatic. And for a downward acceleration, it would be subhydrostatic. Um, and this will realign itself based on the, the acceleration. We talked about uh, the same kinds of behaviors for uh, rotating fluids. Oops. And we didn't spend so much time on it. But we basically made the case that if you have a fluid that's rotating around its center line, um, instead of being horizontal, it will develop a surface. That surface will be uh, parabolic, actually, as it turns out. And we can calculate what the orientation of that surface is uh, based on the elevation of that surface, just by doing a little uh, manipulation. And it's not quite as straightforward in that we'd have to typically integrate things to be able to determine what that is. But this, is, this would be the elevation of the surface. We don't know what the constant, actually this is already integrated. So in this case we don't know what this constant is here. So we'd have to write the equation at some location where we know for instance r is equal to zero and we know what z is and that would automatically give us this coefficient. And from that, then we could extend it to be able to see exactly how z varies as you go across here. And so that was our, our closing shot in, in this. So this kind of leads naturally onto the things that we'll talk about in terms of, of, of Bernoulli. And uh, the reasons for that are that uh, the equations that we developed, and you know I love the... the the logic of the math in this in, at some level is that these expressions that we developed that we used for the first three weeks which were after throwing the acceleration terms away came from some basic equations first of all for linear acceleration we were just writing uh, essentially f equals ma 
which are vectors. And I think we said last time that when we look at rotational behavior, we also look at f equals ma, but a is the angular acceleration that is involved in this. And so both of these expressions, this is really the only uh, law that we use in this class, Newton's second law, both linearly and rotationally. Remember we talked about the kind of strange video with the rather loud guy uh, talking about his amazing science. And we develop these expressions from these basic expressions. So for Bernoulli, what we are interested in, uh, and a direct parallel with that behavior, is that we could think of, um, as we talk about our new topic of fluid dynamics, true fluid dynamics, we could think of uh, behavior, and see how well I can draw it, if I can draw an airfoil quite well, that's not too bad actually, my drawing is getting better it seems, maybe. And so we can look at the fluid flow that occurs on a, an airfoil as it goes past, maybe that splits at what we call a stagnation point and goes either way. We can look at the coordinate system that we've already developed. We can use x and we'll use z as vertically upwards. And so what we can do is, I guess before I change, uh, I'll do this, is that if you imagine putting a tracer of smoke in that follows the flow paths, then these so-called streak lines, flow lines or streak lines, would be the pathway that a particle of air or liquid, uh, gas or liquid, particle of fluid, would take as it goes around this, this structure. And so what we're interested in are two things. We could um, we can define a local coordinate system. And I'll do it here. And we'll refer to it as normal and streamline, I guess, S for streamline. And so this coordinate system that we have that's fixed for our right-hand rule, uh, we modify just to be congruent with, to be orthogonal to the streamline at any single point. And of course, to be a multitude of these uh, orthogonal coordinate systems at every point along the streamline. And our interest in this is being able to do two things, as, as I'm sure you, you, um, you know. And that is, if you take a point uh, along a streamline, between one and two, then what we can do is we can write um, Bernoulli, Bernoulli as, I always write it in this way, And you probably know that this expression, well, you, you know that it has to be units of length. This is elevation. And so this is a, in meters. This has to be in meters. This has to be in meters as well. You can go through that and check it for yourself. And if we write it at point one, then the whole thing is that this overall expression is going to be exactly the same at point two. That's the whole point of um, uh, Bernoulli's expression. And so the idea is that because no energy is used up, there's no friction in the system. It's specifically done for what are referred to as inviscid fluids. In other words, viscosity is equal to zero. There's no viscosity. And of course, the viscosity of a fluid is the reason you have, a, have to have a pump at the end of a pipe, because the friction of that fluid going along a pipe uh, expends energy in heat uh, and sound to some degree, but mainly in heat frictional resistance, and that loss is really what viscosity is doing. The viscosity is a measure of how much that loss is. The higher the viscosity, the more pressure you have to apply to pump it, and therefore the larger this is. So in some cases, this is always finite, but sometimes it's so small that this is actually a good approximation of what's going on. So it works for inviscid fluids only. And so that's where we come with this particular point. So what am I going to do? All right. So the other thing, which I didn't mention, which I will, I guess, uh, also, is that you could also imagine writing this equation at these two points. So at point number three, 
and point number four. And we can write a similar expression, not this one, but that allows us to be able to go across the, the streamline that says something about it. And you won't be completely surprised to, to realize that the pressure distribution that you'd have as you go across this is kind of like what we have in a swimming pool. It deviates from it in some ways that we'll talk about later. But it allows us, for instance, to be able to set the Bernoulli components, elevation, pressure, and now a rotational velocity and acceleration, to be able to write this equation at two points. And the whole idea is that you end up with six unknowns from writing this equation twice at two points. And you hope you have five of them to be able to solve for the six. That's basically what we're attempting to do. So there's nothing more than that. So we're looking at these two behaviors, along a streamline and perpendicular to a streamline, which of these. And we'll deal with this one first. And so it might not come as a great surprise to you that when we're talking about um, going normal to a streamline, that the expressions that we're talking about, uh, so, no, sorry, along a streamline, this is the one we'll deal with today. I don't think we'll deal with this to, today at all is that the expressions that we're dealing with are something that we've seen before. I'll draw this little diagram that makes, should make sense to you um, in terms of two points, points one and two. And of course you could think of this as being a little packet of fluid in a container that we're accelerating upwards at some, or moving upwards at some velocity or acceleration to get from point one to point two. And so it's a bit like what we talked about before, uh, but now what we're going to do is we're going to think of this not as terms of a static fluid moving in a container, we're going to think that this packet of fluid is physically translating, and to translate it we have to apply some acceleration uh, to, to start it from zero, work against inertia, and to be able to move it. And so bear with me while we do a very quick derivation. So you'll recognize all of these expressions from before. So the static case, let me write it out first. You've seen this. Change in pressure with elevation minus minus rho g minus uh, rho a z is equal to zero. So the place that you've seen this is that if I change font, I'm getting very fancy with this, is that if we break this up, this would be F minus MA equals zero. Talked about it before. These terms are the forces that are applied on structures, pressure on a structure, how it changes with depth. We know that this, this, this term is zero, then this is dp dz is equal to unit weight. Uh, and we've used that, and we know that's always true. If we have an acceleration, then we need to worry about that. And so what else can we do with this now? Um, we can merely look at this expression here. We know that acceleration is equal to change in velocity with time. We know that we can rewrite that as change in velocity with time multiplied by one. And so that gives us, if we now take these two terms together, so now we have dv dz, which are these two terms, and d z dt. So this is how velocity changes from point one to point two. You can think of this, right? This is velocity. It's changing as we change in location. I guess I did write a coordinate system. What's this? This is how location changes with time. So this is just purely a velocity. Nothing more. And so if we rewrite that, we end up with an expression, and I'll just write it this way dv dz uh, oh, no, 
actually I won't do that. I'll just write it out in its final form. This term, you can do the differentiation by the product rule, and it comes out to be change in elevation phi squared. So this whole term has changed from a rate of change of velocity with time. So if you're driving in your car, you know that you're going at 10 miles an hour, then you're going at 20 miles an hour. So you know how your velocity has changed with time, and that's useful to you in your car. But if you're standing on the side of the road and watching someone, you can see how someone's velocity changes uh, with location to them going past you, dv dz, change in velocity with location. And this allows you to be able to put this velocity, I guess they're just the same, right? This is dv dt. This is the reference frame when you're in your car. You know how changing velocity if you're sitting in your car. This is the reference frame if you're an observer watching the car go past at some velocity. And you can see how quickly it goes from point A to point B, which is some location. I guess Z is vertical. So I guess it's the space shuttle, not the car. But it just allows you to change your reference frame. And so the point is that we can resubstitute this back into here. And if we do that, we end up with the same expression, minus dp dz minus rho g minus rho times a half change in location with v squared. Already looks like Bernoulli, right? Uh, equals zero. And what we could do is we could multiply through by dz. And if we do that, well, I guess I could do it on the same equation. So this would be times dz times dz times dz. And so then we have something like integral of pressure minus density g dz integral minus uh, integral rho a half well, I guess we get rid of this. Actually, we don't have an integral at all, do we, because of that. Uh, uh, rho a half v squared and that is zero. And so if we do the final integrations, we end up with um, pressure. We end up with, I'm going to make them all positive just because we can. Pressure, uh, we'll end up with rho g z and rho 1 over 2 v squared. equals constant, right? Because we've integrated them all. So instead of being equal to zero, we haven't done it between limits. And if we want to, my handwriting seems to be getting worse. I like to divide things through by rho g. And we have, we switch these, but we have p over unit weight plus elevation plus uh, v squared over 2g. You'll learn to love this equation equals constant. That's it. So that's it. So I think it's not a, a particularly involved derivation, but it serves to make the point that we love Isaac Newton, because that's all we're using. We're new using Newton's second law. Uh, if we split this up again to be able to make that point, you'd certainly note that um, this, if we split the term here, this is equal to F minus MA equals zero, kind of, because the integration allowed us to change the zero to a constant, but that's essentially the component. And I guess uh, what this is, is if we divided this through by a volume, on both sides, I think these would be the same, 
obviously nothing there. These would be the right units. So it's kind of a force per unit volume of what these things are. Seems strange that this is a component of Newton's law, but obviously this is ele elevation and it's potential, right? If you have a weight up here, it has some energy, you drop it, it accelerates, and that's really what the fluid is doing. So fluids and solid masses really aren't very different from each other. So, so that's it. That's all we need to, to be able to understand what's going on. So this is Bernoulli's law. Um, as we said before, if it's constant along its length, we can write it at two locations. Instead of having three variables, you have six. Three at point one, three at point two, and you hope that you only have a one unknown, and you can solve for the system. If you have two unknowns, you have to do something else. We enforce what's called continuity, that volumes don't change. Essentially, we can write, well, we'll deal with that later. Let's not do it this day. So anyway, so that's where we're going with this. So probably um, it's worthwhile just going through the things we've talked about. The assumptions for Bernoulli are exactly the ones that are laid out here. These are kind of follow-on notes. Really, all I want to do today is go through one example to be able to make, make the point. And if we look at it, if we look at Bernoulli, there are four requirements that it satisfies. So the fluid is incompressible. Well, we use it for airplane wings, and it works quite well. So incompressible is kind of a, a misnomer in some respects, because obviously nothing is truly incompressible. But so long as you're not going at huge velocities, where the pressures will change a large amount, and therefore compressibility will be manifest in a large amount, then it can be used for gases, even though it's really only applicable to incompressible fluids that don't change, that are isothermal, that don't change temp temperatures. It assumes that no uh, vortices are generated along the, the flow path. So it assumes that it's laminar flow, that as you go along the flow path, there are no eddies that are uh, created, which is often true. Um, actually, if you look at airplanes landing, you can often see vortices rolling off the tips of the wings. And uh, so it's not completely true for airfoils. But largely, if you look at the main body of the wing, vortices are what you want to avoid because they're very inefficient and you want the wing to be efficient to provide lift and also to be streamlined when you're going at higher velocities when you're at cruising altitude. It's always written for steady flow and steady can be a strange concept because you realize that if you look at the pressure he uh, velocity here and you look at the velocity here, they're not necessarily the same velocity. But steady in this instance means that in your reference frame when you take a photograph of this airfoil, that the velocity here is equal to 10 meters a second at second one, and it's also equal to 10 meters a second 10 minutes later and an hour later. And likewise, the velocity here might be 9 meters a second, but it has to be that for all time. So it means um, in terms of that picture. It doesn't mean that as you go from this, the pressure doesn't change. It means that the pressure is uh, steady when you take a, a photograph of the thing. And the one thing that we've talked about as well is it has to be inviscid. So ostensibly, viscosity is equal to zero. How close to zero? Well, we'll, we'll perhaps see as we go through the examples. And so these are giving some examples. So by doing what we did, we've uh, subverted this pages and pages and pages of stuff but we ended up at the same location. You'll certainly recognize this in what we did today, along a streamline, which we integrated. And this is just leaving it. Sometimes if you're worried about compressibility of a fluid, you might leave this term here so that you could look at the change in pressure and what that means to the change in density at two different points, but we don't need to Pretty clever, don't you think, for 1738, even before I was born, <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> okay, so what's it mean? Well, this is the, the best uh, example I can think of to, 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 to do it. Uh, we'll, we'll do a couple of different examples. We'll do the plain example from San Francisco, and we'll look at the example below, and that's really what we'll do today. But the, the basic idea is this. We could write this expression at this point, point one, and we could write it at point number two, which is this. And, well, writing it in longhand, it's, we'll write it so often, um, you need to obviously commit this to memory. 
not very difficult. It just repeats itself. Even I can manage that. Okay? So this is the expression that we'll grow to love if we don't love it already. And so you can think of what these terms are. If you look at it at this point, I guess it could have been this point, is that a portion of it is due to the elevation, its potential energy, how high it is. It takes some energy to get it there, so it has some energy if you drop it from there, which is this term. There's a portion of it if you go up to the free surface. Uh, and if you looked at the pressure distribution with depth, and if I draw it um, with negative z, then you'd see that it would look something like this. And the distribution would be like this. So this would be pressure at point one. And so above this, uh, take on trust that you could assume it's like a swimming pool. It's linear. Uh, we'll see whether that's true later. And it de depends where the, whether the streamlines are curving or not. But for now, take it as that. And there's a term which is above here which defines the velocity. So if it's going at some finite velocity, then the velocity squared divided by the local velocity squared divided by gravity, two times gravity, gives you this little artificial elevation. And so we can think of this as a hydraulic grade line or an energy grade line. Hydraulic or energy, I won't write them out. And it's kind of an artificial line. But really, it's the magnitude of this constant, right? So at point one, it's equal to this. At point two, it still has to be equal to this. But the components of what the, uh, the different components have changed in some proportion. And so the proportion is, if you imagine putting a pitot tube, so this is the thing that's on the front of the plane that you see when you get on at University Park Airport as you climb up the steps, a little angled tube pointing forwards, hollow in the, the front, and also with a hollow annulus port on the side. And physically what it measures is stagnation of the fluid, that the fluid physically hits the front of it, it loses its kinetic energy, and it converts it into a pressure. That's, it's, you're destroying momentum. F equals ma, mass times acceleration is mass times rate of change of velocity, and mass times rate of change of velocity is rate of change of momentum. So the change of momentum gives, carries on this velocity head directly into the pressure. So if you measure the behavior at this point here, at point number two, with elevation in this tube, the pressure distribution would look like this. because you're measuring it directly at this point where it has zero velocity. So P2, but velocity 2 is equal to zero. Velocity here is not equal to zero, clearly. It's moving at some rate. Uh, now you've destroyed it. So what it does is converts that kinetic energy into a pressure, pressure head. And so in this, um, how do I draw it? Uh, this I draw it this way. If I change color, this would be exactly it. Right. This would be uh, some magnitude equal to P1. And this magnitude here would be equal to V1 squared over 2g. So what we've done in this case is still the same elevation, same elevations. So the only thing that can have happened is can have happened to these two terms here because these z2 and z1 cancel out for each other. And so what we're doing is we're transferring something which was pressure and velocity head, velocity head and pressure, into only pressure. So the pressure added to it is equal to v1 squared over 2g, which we've killed by making v2 equal 0. Should have added that. So this, I didn't add that before. And so that's all it is. So we can think of this as being a, um, a datum. The fact that the left and the right side equal each other means it's a horizontal line. 
And so wherever, wherever we go along the same streamline, that's going to be true. So we could look at point three, bad three. And this term should still be true. Z3 plus P3 over unit weight plus V3 squared over 2G. That will still be true. But now the proportions have changed. Elevation has changed. And so this now is not the same as Z1 and Z2, etc. So you get the picture. So that's, that's the deal. And so all it is is we shunt the energy between these different components. Um, pressure energy, if you like it. Um, potential energy. And kinetic energy. Those are three. So it's instructive just to do this uh, perhaps uh, straightforward elevation. Um, evaluation. If we look at the terms of Bernoulli, and I'm specifically going to write them below, and we look at these three points for the syringe. And so we can look at each of these three points, maybe point one is down here, point two is up here, and point three is up here. We know that this is a streamline. It can't, it's not steady, I guess, so it's a bit of a trick. Imagine that this was uh, uh, a steady behavior. It can't be steady, right? Because we'll run out of fluid within the syringe with time and it has to then die. But, so it's not quite steady, but in a short term, we might be able to assume that it's steady. We could look at the contributions from each of these uh, components. So what would we think here? Well, the reason a syringe squirts at you, or a squirt gun, or a, a Nerf gun, or whatever, um, is that the pressure would be high. So let me do it here. So this pressure here is high. The velocity, well, it's not moving very quickly. I guess it's uh, not moving at large velocity. So think of the velocity as being not very large. Uh, and the elevation, in this case, would also be quite long. So the, the potential energy that we have is relatively long. As we go up to this point here, what have we got? Well, it's squirting out at some big rate, so we'd imagine that the velocity would be relatively high, because it's coming out of here. The pressure was high here, but if you think about it, we've said that the pressure at a point always acts the same in all directions. Right? That was our requirement, is that P acts uniformly. And so we know that if we look horizontally and resolve horizontally, the pressure acting is atmospheric and it's very and low compared to maybe the pressure that's driving this flow. So since the pressure across this has to be low, the pressure in general at the nozzle has to be relatively low. And so this, we would think, would be low. And the elevation, well, not very high either, but because it's only gone up this amount. Then if we take this point here, what, what are the attributes of this? This is still on the streamline. It's reached its maximum elevation, so I suppose the elevation would be high. All the energy is associated with its potential. It can drop down. Uh, its velocity, it's reached its zenith, its apex, so it's not going up anymore. So this has to be zero. And the pressure here is also atmospheric for the same reasons that we talked about this. And this is equal to, so this is my notation for small or et cetera. Probably don't need to use both notations. And so really the attributes of this would be that most of the energy is stored here as potential energy. Most of the storage here is kinetic energy. And most of the storage here is in strain, stored strain energy, if you like, in terms of a stored potential, like um, energy stored in the spring to push out. And so all we do is we go through these points. Um, because they're all in a streamline, if you added them together, whatever they are, they would all have to equal the same constant. Right? But we're not bothering with that. And we can look at how the different forms of energy are, are parsed between them. And so that's, that's all we need to know. And you see that down here. So I think that's kind of instructive to, to be able to do that. So we have five minutes. Let's see if we can do it. Um, for those of you who came in late, uh, you didn't see this. 
our San Francisco Billy. Stage demonstration. Don't do this at home. You can't of hear the many it. No, no point playing it because you can't hear it. It's very it's, uh, exciting elevator music, I guess it is. And so, you remember, you saw this. Uh, we also use videos in this class of people hanging onto the fence when the planes are taking off at, at St. Martin in the Caribbean which uh, the fence is too close to the end of the runway and they go horizontal nearly uh, and get a lot of sand in their face as well. People getting pushed off the beach. But this is just to demonstrate the power that's uh, present within a, uh, in a jet engine. Quite amazing actually. I presume they did pull it out of San Francisco Bay. You're not allowed to do those things. And perhaps they drained the liquids from it before they did it as well. I'm sure they did. And perhaps it doesn't even have an, uh, a motor in it while they do that. And so, well, we have, the, we have the technology now to be able to address that. And so how would we solve a straightforward problem like that? I'll roll back just to find a, a fresh sheet. And I'll start my drawing. I love drawing these things. So what we got? Uh, you, how would you think for this for drawing? Pretty good, eh, don't you think? <laughs> so, Bernoulli. So what do you think the uh, flow lines are going to look like? Now you can probably guess that pretty well. So it's going to come here, it's going to hit the truck, it's going to stagnate, and it's going to go mainly over the top. Maybe some of it will go underneath. And so we're interested in knowing exactly what the pressure is at this other point too. We can write Bernoulli Z1 plus P1 of the unit weight of the gas, of the fluid, which is the air, uh, plus V1 squared over 2G. And that's at point 1, and it has to be equal to the same magnitude at point 2. Uh, V2 squared over 2G. And then we can think about what we know. Well, we're sitting on San Francisco Airport, so the elevations of these points are pretty much the same. So let's get rid of these. They're not zero, but they cancel. Um, what we said about pressures before at a point, we can apply to this particular case as well. It's not so different from air squirting out of a nozzle. If the pressure above and below is atmospheric, then the pressure at the nozzle has to be zero. And so if we work in gauge pressures, this pressure is zero for that. The velocity certainly isn't zero because it's coming out at some velocity v1. Uh, and what's happening here? Well, the velocity here along the streamline, streamline takes an abrupt turn, this velocity is a stagnation point. Where the velocity goes to zero. So V2 is equal to zero. We can argue about that later. Let's not do it today. Because along the streamline, of course, it has continuity, but it changes 90 degrees to itself, so the force has to be delivered. So this is not equal to zero. Uh, oh, sorry, this is equal to zero. So I guess we can do that. And pressure, by definition, is not. You know that when you uh, stand into the wind, you feel a force on your chest. And so you can imagine that's exactly what's happening here. So V1 squared over 2G is equal to P2 over rho G. I guess what question we want to ask, I guess what question we'd like to ask is what is the pressure that's acting on this surface? Uh, we know from your fluid statics that you could imagine that in a gas that it doesn't change much with elevation. And so it must be uniform. And so I suppose we could rewrite this to write it as well. First of all, we can get rid of the G's. And I suppose we could rewrite it to be P2 is equal to V1 squared rho 
only two. And we can solve exactly for the magnitude of that if we know some parameters. And so I, I chose some parameters. Um, V1 squared, I'm taking V1 is equal to 100 meters a second, which is about equal to 200 miles an hour, which is kind of the takeoff speed for jet. Jets cruise at five or 600, right, in the sky. But these are typical magnitudes for takeoff speeds. Density of air, well, you know that, right? of the order of, I think it's 1.25, changes with pressure, but you know it. And so based on that, P2, not rho 2, is equal to 10 to the 2 squared times 1 over 2, which would be equal to uh, 0.5 uh, times 10 to the 4. So 5 times 10 to the 3. And you can check the units, but it should work out to be, if you use SI units, equal to... Just a second. So what else do we want to do now? So we've got a pressure that's acting. So this is 5 kPa. I suppose what we might want to do is just very quickly, as we go out of time here, draw a more sophisticated diagram of our vehicle here, sitting on its wheels, and look at what those forces might be. And so if we look at the pressure acting on this side, P, what is the area of this? Well, truck is 10 feet long, one foot high, right, in terms of the cross section. So 10 feet is three meters, one foot high is one meter. So this is about three meters squared, I would say. Um, and what else would we want to look at? We'd want to look at the weight of the truck acting downwards. We'd want to look at a mechanism by which it fails. I think the mechanism by which it fails is around a pivot point, and so if I was to do a free body on this, um, I would look at these units here, L sub P, right? And so you could resolve moments about this, and it would just be that um, the weight times LW has to equal um, the pressure force, it's called FR, times LP. The force FR is just going to be equal to the pressure multiplied by the area. We know each of these. We know the pressure. We know the area. We know this length, LP. I'd imagine LP is about a meter. Right? I'd imagine that how what, why is a truck? Six feet? A bit more. So I'd imagine LW is about a meter as well. And so you could decide from this what you uh, do and don't know. I would say that probably what you don't know is the weight. We certainly know what this is, right? Because we have this defined here. We know what the pressure is. It's 500 kPa. Uh, the area is 3 meters a second, meters squared. Um, and if you rearrange this, you can come out with, I won't do it here because we're running out of time, but I do have a result on my useful piece of paper. It comes out to being 1,500 meters, 1,500 kilograms. And apparently, a Ford F-150 weighs 3,000 kilograms. I find that difficult to believe. That's 6,000 pounds. Uh, but anyway, apparently that's true. So it's the right order of magnitude of what we're doing. The point, I guess, is that a blast of air at 200 miles an hour, hurricanes go at one, one low 100, right? So incredible gusts uh, from natural sources. But certainly the air out of the jet engine allows us to be able to calculate those things. So you'll notice that in this case, we've done exactly what we had. In this particular case, we only had one unknown. We didn't know what the pressure was. We assumed the velocity. 
and everything else worked out because we have one equation, five known, five knowns, and one unknown. 